So, ladies and gentlemen, good evening again. Oh, <laughs> good day again to the first. Uh, welcome to the first panel. Uh, and the first panel is uh, according to a physical law, which say the time is running from the past via the present to the future. It means the first panel is dealing with the past. Uh, because uh, uh, I would like to remind you on uh, a very famous uh, sentence of George Orwell, who control the past, control the present, and who, who control the past also control the future. It means uh, the control over the past should be in a democratic sense. And this is uh, uh, very important. Uh, because of this, we would like in this first panel to share with you What's, uh, uh, how we deal with the past here in Central Eastern Europe uh, and to hear from you as well what uh, are you thinking about dealing with the past especially in uh, uh, this historical moment in uh, North Africa and uh, Middle East uh, where is the transition just now ongoing and uh, uh, how, what you can uh, take with you from our experience uh, 20, 22 years ago because we made also ma many mistakes in different uh, uh, Eastern European countries. There was a different uh, situation, but uh, the main goal was to overcome the um, situation and the totalitarian regime to open the archive. And after opening the archive, when we wrote the, the, the history, we saw and we recognized the true history, then to uh, go also, uh, also to the reconciliation. And reconciliation is a very important uh, uh, word, uh, word, and uh, um, I'm uh, uh, honored to be uh, also part of the European platform for reconciliation as a member of the European Parliament. Uh, European Parliament is uh, um, keeping the, the flag of uh, protecting human rights not only inside of the European Union but worldwide. Uh, we have uh, uh, even one special subcommittee to the Committee of Foreign Affairs dealing with protection of human rights uh, globally. Um, I have the honor and uh, the, um, the obligation also and privilege today to share with you the uh, Sakharov Prize uh, uh, nominations for this year's and laureate of the Sakharov Prize. Uh, and maybe many of you know that there are five uh, people from uh, Middle East, from North Africa and the Middle East uh, who are uh, the nominees and uh, the laureates of uh, this uh, Sakharov Prize. But maybe a few words about uh, uh, Andrei Sakharov. Uh, when I was a child and I went to school here in uh, Bulgaria, uh, even to mention the word, uh, uh, the name Sakharov was uh, um, dangerous uh, to do it uh, publicly. Uh, because uh, Andrei Safarov was one of the uh, most um, famous dissidents in the uh, former Soviet Union and uh, because uh, uh, as a physicist and as uh, one of the father of the hydrogen bomb, uh, he was very concerned about the misuse of this uh, nuclear power against uh, humanity and he raised uh, his voice for protection of human rights and for democracy and because of this he was uh, one of the uh, most uh, um, prominent dissident and uh, enemy of the totalitarian regime in uh, the former Soviet uh, Union bloc, including uh, Central Eastern Europe. Uh, now, in uh, um, 1988, Sakharov was still alive because he died in 1989, uh, the European Parliament decided uh, uh, to create uh, this uh, Sakharov uh, Prize uh, for Defender of Human Rights globally and uh, to motivate uh, this uh, uh, human rights uh, um, protection development in, in uh, uh, the world. I would like only with a few words before we start with the panelists uh, uh, to draw your attention of, uh, on, the, uh, on, on the name of uh, these five uh, uh, persons and to uh, make some comparison because uh, when I saw this, I, I, I really recognized that uh, the, uh, by sight of the different uh, cultural and maybe political and economical background, uh, the instruments of uh, the totalitarian regimes or the answer to these uh, violences are quite similar. Uh, for example, the, the young man from uh, Tunisia, the market trader, Mohamed Boazizi, who uh, set himself on fire on December 19, 
2010 in protest against the constant humiliation uh, by the Tunisian authorities. Uh, he died only a few weeks later in uh, the hospital, but what he has done was a, a big motivation for the Tunisian people only uh, on his uh, funeral, 5,000 people attended and then uh, started the protest movement in Tunisia and spread in all uh, other Arab uh, countries. But for sure, thinking on uh, Mohamed Bouazizi, we cannot, uh, um, uh, we, we must also remember on Jan Palach. Jan Palach in uh, Czechoslovakia those days, uh, he burned himself as well in Prague in 1968. And uh, uh, his, uh, uh, this act uh, of uh, sacrifice uh, also motivated and started uh, the uh, protest movement uh, in Czechoslovakia, but uh, also in uh, Central Eastern Europe. Then we have uh, Ahmed al-Zubar, Ahmed al-Sanusi, uh, one of the, if not maybe the longest uh, political prisoner in the world. He was 31 years in prison from 1970, and uh, uh, um, Colonel Gaddafi never removed the death penalty over him. That means during the whole period in the prison, he uh, expected to be uh, executed uh, every night. Um, remembering uh, this, I uh, can tell you that amongst us even today, and one of the uh, panelists uh, for tomorrow is one person names, uh, from Bulgaria named uh, Gogo Saraivanov, uh, who was uh, uh, sentenced two times for, to death from the communist uh, regime, and uh, uh, who as well expected his execution every night, and even uh, the staff of the prison uh, make some play with him going in the night, opening the door and saying, uh, now you're on the road to be executed. The comparison is, is here. We, we, uh, the experience center is in Europe and uh, experience with the authoritarian regimes in, in uh, North uh, Africa and uh, Middle East is uh, similar. Then I, I, was, I will only mention the name of uh, Razan Zatunek, 34-year-old uh, uh, lawyer in the field of human rights and the creator of the informal bloc uh, Syrian Human Rights, uh, who reported uh, who report what uh, happened in Syria. Uh, Ali Barzat, 60-year-old political satirist and well-known critic of the Syrian uh, regime, uh, the Syrian regime uh, tried uh, in uh, August 2001 uh, to, uh, not tried, but he break his, his two hands as a sign of, of warning, also uh, uh, confiscated uh, uh, his uh, drawings. And uh, uh, the last but not least, uh, Asma uh, Mafuz, a uh, 26 year old uh, founder of the Young Movement, April the 6th. Uh, uh, in uh, Egypt. So these uh, five uh, personalities uh, will be awarded uh, in the European Parliament uh, in the last session in the Parliament uh, starting from uh, um, uh, 12th of uh, December uh, this year and uh, I hope some of them can make it to go to Strasbourg for, for this uh, ceremony but uh, the political signal I think is very important that uh, uh, we European Union is uh, are staying, we at together uh, staying behind uh, you, but behind the Arab uh, Spring or the Arab uh, Democratic Movement and uh, we hope for you uh, that uh, uh, you can live also in a freedom and democracy. I will uh, not uh, go further in, uh, uh, in, in this uh, uh, description. I'm, uh, as I say, uh, proud that also European Parliament is uh, co-organizer of uh, this uh, event. And uh, the first backing to uh, first platform's topic dealing with the past. Uh, I would like to present the panelists in this topic. Uh, Mr. Eftim Kostadinov is the chairman of the Committee for Dissolving and, uh, the Documents and Announcing Affiliation of Bulgarian Citizens to the State Security and Intelligence Services of the Bulgarian National Army. He is the former communist. Uh, uh, services, uh, secret police services, the agents in, in the uh, infiltrate in uh, the, uh, every part of the life, um, political, economical, social, cultural life, uh, even uh, in, the, in the religion uh, denominations. Uh, 
Uh, then uh, Joachim Förster is uh, head of the department and deputy director at the Federal uh, Commissioner for the Records of the State Security Service, the so-called Stasi of the former German Democratic Republic. Uh, I think Germany has the most uh, uh, profound experience with dealing with the past. Uh, the one country was uh, separated for decades and uh, uh, the people lived uh, uh, separate, uh, was forced uh, to, to live separate for so many years. And uh, we can be only proud and happy that on, in Europe, not only Germany is reunificated, but also our continent is uh, almost reunificated. We have still some uh, black spots like Western Balkan, uh, like uh, some countries uh, in the east, like Ukraine, Belarus and uh, uh, Caucasus and uh, Moldova, but uh, uh, the direction is uh, uh, to freedom and uh, democracy. Then we have uh, for on my right side uh, Miroslav uh, Lecky. He's uh, from the Institute uh, for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes in the Czech Republic. And uh, uh, we have here Mr. Said uh, Sadek. Is professor of political sociology in the American University in uh, Cairo in Egypt. I'm looking forward for the discussion. First of all, for the presentation of the panelists, I would like to ask them uh, uh, to limit themselves for, for around six to ten minutes maximum to have time for uh, questions and uh, debates on this very, very important, interesting, but also important for present and future uh, topic. So first of all, maybe uh, the experience from Bulgaria, Mr. Kostadinov, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Kovacev, Your Excellencies, uh, Minister, ladies and gentlemen. The very characteristic of uh, uh, totalitarian um, states means using the security services to support the foundations of uh, the political power. So there is a security police that uh, monitors every aspect of life and on the other hand uh, serves uh, certain causes by uh, external intelligence. When we talk about um, this, uh, we need to underline that throughout the whole period of socialism, these services have been controlled by the Committee for State Security of uh, the Soviet Union, that is KGB. And it was used to <coughs> serve the ideological cause of uh, the political power and to counter the Western uh, countries. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, these countries chose the democratic path of development, creating conditions for uh, free uh, competition and multi-party system. So there was a competition of ideas, values, visions about the future. And that meant that the special uh, services had to be transformed. They had to meet the needs of uh, the modern society. This transition in Bulgaria formally happened once uh, state security was closed down in 1990 as a structure. The, the sixth department of the state security was closed down and this was the political uh, police. But there was a very painful issue which was not resolved, and this is the issue of the so-called agents and collaborators of the previous regime. So there was a need to shed light on these uh, uh, collaborators and agents. The motive was that people wanted to know the names of the so-called collaborators because very often these people were guilty of the difficult uh, fate of uh, many ordinary people. So there was uh, lists uh, uh, published, but however, files and records of the agents were um, 
destroyed for 20 years. Different commissions were structured, assigned with the task to follow certain rules and shed light on the public uh, figures who uh, served as agents to the communist uh, services. But none of these commissions could do the whole job because of numerous restrictions imposed by the Constitutional Court. From the distance of time, we can say that the main reason was that there were agents across the political spectrum. So, and for this reason, there was this long period of uh, uh, influence that these people can uh, exert on um, many other people. There were conditions for political Blackmail. blackmailing and uh, there was a kind of conspiracy and uh, sick, isolated society called community that uh, helped uh, to have uh, people of uh, theirs uh, take important positions. In, 2000, in December of 2006, a month before Bulgaria joined the EU, the current uh, law for uh, uh, the current law for access to the uh, archives was uh, voted. It was adopted by the 40th National Assembly. I was a deputy of this parliament and I was member of the Commission for Internal Security and Foreign Policy and I was involved in the Preparation. There are several goals to have uh, in one place the archives of uh, the agents, the intelligence service, and the military uh, service. Also, provide for a broad access to these documents, uh, shed light on the names of people applying for public positions or involved in public functions. There was a committee elected, and from the very beginning, this committee had a very difficult task because there was a lack of trust in the society with respect to the truth uh, from, this, uh, from all these documents. So this commission had to, step by step, recover the trust and confidence of the society. So we started with uh, creating the centralized archive, but we first uh, had to prove that we are an independent body. And this was the most difficult uh, task. There were attempts uh, to exert pressure on us, but we always relied on the law. I have always said that this law is good. Why so? Because it works. And it is, of course, not liked by many, but um, uh, th there was a need to have the so-called uh, bad messenger uh, who would say the truth that the society needs to know the truth about the people in power. The first steps of this commission were very difficult. We started uh, work without having uh, any building, administration, or um, repository. So we had to first equip uh, a premises of, like a breathing room because uh, many people want, were interested in uh, reading more. The next task was to shed light on the agents and the collaborators. Again, on the basis of the law, we started checking documents, and we announced the names of people who collaborated with the former security services and are part of the um, ruling uh, system. We have checked more than uh, 144,000 Bulgarian citizens, and uh, from them, 6,000 have been announced uh, as uh, belonging to uh, the security system, so between 5 to 7 percent of uh, people working in different institutions uh, were part of the previous uh, system. They were and this shows that uh, across this period, people 
people from the former security secret services have been in key positions in the government in the so the conclusion is that it's very difficult for the society to cut the ties with its communist past the discussion is painful the reaction of all people disclosed is uh, uh, varies from complete denial to uh, finding excuses. Very few are those who um, say the truth because sometimes the motives are very per have been very personal. Then uh, we also. Uh, we don't want uh, to become a tribunal, we don't want to discuss uh, guilt. We have often explained that our uh, task is not to provide justice, but rather to inform the society on the different cases. And any uh, charges against the Commission are void because a uh, big part of the documents have been destroyed which means that the Commission is un unable to analyze the work of the specific uh, collaborator. And uh, any attempt to put division lines uh, only deepens the process of confrontation, but does not help to address uh, the recent issues of the recent past. Uh, we made progress uh, in the implementation of Article 27 after uh, the cabinet of Prime Minister Borisov came into power that relates to uh, people proposed for taking uh, important public offices. So, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me in the end of my uh, presentation to focus on the centralized ar archive that we de developed for less than four years. We started with the building, uh, with uh, full uh, refurbishing, adapting to the uh, new uh, uh, intentions and uh, also recruiting people uh, who serve um, uh, our goal. I'm proud to say that we were able to develop the most modern archive in Bulgaria that uh, catalogized as a catalog and um, method to use. And we uh, have very high reputation in our counterparts in Germany, Poland, Slovakia, and uh, Romania. We exchange. Um, uh, ideas and initiatives have joint uh, initiatives, publications, organize uh, scientific conferences. The doors of the European network are open. We have rules for accepting new members and observers, and we hear that we will have m there will be more um, similar com to our commissions who will be joining uh, this network uh, also from the Arab countries, and we will be very happy to help. In the end, I want to express uh, my satisfaction with the fact that we already have a five-year experience in this area. Thank you for your attention. for this uh, overview of what's uh, happened in this field in Bulgaria in the last uh, few years. Experience in Central Eastern Europe uh, is different. We have bad and, uh, and uh, good experience. Uh, some countries manage to restrict the access of a former communist uh, elite or communist uh, member of uh, secret police to the uh, political offices, uh, some less. This country who, who uh, didn't manage to do it uh, in the 90s, they suffered, so to say, a longer transition period, unfortunately, my country including, because we lost uh, uh, almost over 10 years in uh, uh, debate about uh, uh, should we do it or should we not do it uh, in a consistent manner. 
Let's uh, go further to, uh, to Germany and uh, to the famous uh, Stasi experience of the, of the German nation. And I'm uh, honored to give the floor of, to Mr. Uh, Förster. Mr. Förster, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me make two remarks in advance. Uh, when TV first showed the first pictures and reports of the uprises in Tunisia and Egypt, in December 2010, many Germans and many Europeans felt strongly reminded of the events in the former GDR and in Eastern Europe uh, 21 or 22 years ago, as in 1989 and 1990. But of course, uh, there are differences in every country. Every country has its own political and social situation, so it's very difficult to give general advices. I only can report about our experiences. The second is I was very impressed and touched by the movie opening this Congress yesterday, because although acting as a lawyer with rules and administration, experience shows that such a human emotional approach um, can be um, a very important or decisive motor in a society to come to terms with the past. That is the experience in Germany too. Mr. Komandarev uh, making this uh, very impressive movie himself made the important statement after the movie yesterday. When there's no memory, there's no <coughs> justice. And I will add uh, to this <coughs> sentence, no future without the truth. And that leads to the heart of the discussion in Germany in the years 1989 until 1991, whether to open the archives, the records of the Stasi, the former secret police in Germany, East Germany, or not. There were controversial debates in the last GDR as well as during the process, uh, during the process of reunification with the West German Bundesrepublik. There was skepticism, especially also in West Germany. Many feared that it could be a burden for the future in the unified democratic society to open these archives and to provide these information. And of course, uh, there was a collision with the constitutional law of uh, personal rights and personal data. If at all, they wanted to add the records to the federal archives, the consequence would have been that no access to personal data at all of the members and supporters of the Stasi would have been possible for at least 30 years after the death of a person. Finally, you know, in Germany a special act and a special administration was established. And that is, was and is a synthesis between the demands of the civil right movement of the peaceful revolution in East Germany and the protection of individual rights uh, under the constitution of, the, of Germany, which developed in 40 years. But it was a premiere. It was the first time of the disclosure of a security archives of a secret police and with respect to the purpose, the information had been collected. It was like a use the other way around, a reverse use. Uh, let me say some words about the basic rules of our special act uh, with which we um, have been working since 20 years, exactly 20 years. First, a strong protection of personal data of data subjects. That means 
of the victims, even no access for current secret uh, services, because that would have caused a prolonging of injustice. Secondly, the restricted individual rights of personal data for employees and unofficial informers of the Stasi. That means, in concrete, data, name, data, data and names of those people can be provided without their consent. And third, a limited access to the information collecting in the archives only for the purposes and the condition and under the conditions of the, this special act. Um, this act, the purposes of this act, the Stasi uh, Act, uh, Stasi um, Act, um, correspond to the demands with the demands of the civil rights movement. First, it's possible an individual access to the files by the data subjects, and that. Have been, has been used by approximately 1.9 million people. Secondly, the vetting of the public service of members of parliaments and special public functions. Um, we have been worked with uh, millions of uh, requests too in this uh, matter. Thirdly, the purpose of criminal prosecution and the purpose of rehabilitation of victims. And last but not least, the access for researchers and media. After 20 years experience, we can, um, providing the records, we can say something about the positive results and, of course, something about the problems we have to consider. The positive results after 20 years is, first, people who had suffered from Stasi or generally wanted to find out about the influence of the Stasi on their lives made extensive use of the possibility to get access to their files. And there was no uh, case of violence or revenge uh, as far as I know, especially in situation in Germany. And we don't have to forget that is not only to uncover the um, <coughs> supporting of the secret police by special people, it's also the exclusion of suspicion to uh, in, in families and in, uh, within friend. <coughs> Secondly, the influence of former members and unofficial informers in the public sector and in the civil service was eliminated to a great extent. Uh, the target was to change the elite in the new democratic state. Of course, Germany here was in a privileged situation because of the reunification with West Germany. We know that. But especially in the local sphere in East Germany, of course, we had the problem too. And third point, the records and files have been important sources for decisions taking in many cases of rehabilitation and in more than 25 preliminary proceedings. Also, it was possible to track down and to uncover important assets of the financial property of the former SED, the Communist Party of East Germany. <coughs> and fourth, the right of media and researchers to get information from the MFS, from the Stasi archives, and to use it has been a decisive and important uh, 
point for the public discussion about the past in science and media, especially in those cases where, uh, in which the vetting was not uh, complete. Um, what were the problems we have to consider after 20 years? The first point, the concentration uh, on the Stasi itself, that uh, can be a problem. That is not a problem of the work of our administration. It's a problem of society and law in general. We only dealt with the legacy of the Schicke police, the Stasi. But in some cases it could happen that ordinary unofficial informers of the Stasi had to bear consequences for the Stasi contacts. While on the other hand, some party functionaries or staff members of former government offices went untouched. Uh, the second point concerning the vetting. The vetting has not been universally applied uh, in <coughs> Germany in general to an uh, equal uh, extent that uh, is caused by the federal uh, constitution in Germany. The competence for the public service uh, is by the member states of federal Germany. So uh, it's not possible to make a rule, centralized rule, uh, about the vetting of, uh, and the duty of vetting and, of course, uh, especially of the consequences. And so in the several German states, the consequences were very different. And that is one reason why we have a present discussion about this point, because in, in some uh, states, for example Brandenburg, the consequences of the vetting were not as consequently as in other uh, East German uh, states. And so now we have, a, after 22 years, after 20 years, we have, a, we have had a big discussion and we will have um, no, um, a new uh, law prolonging the possibility of vetting for another uh, eight years until 2009. And uh, the last point is that many victims are not satisfied with the uh, results of um, the coming to terms with the past, uh, for example, concerning the criminal um, sentences. Uh, we heard about that today in other um, respects. Uh, but, uh, the, and there's a famous word by one uh, member of the civil rights movement of East Germany. We wanted to have justice but we uh, got the state of rule uh, <laughs> uh, under the law, and that's a difference. And we have to ask ourselves, uh, as far as it is uh, possible at all, to make a complete 100% uh, justice with the instruments of a democratic uh, society. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, it's difficult to give advices. We only can give the pragmatic advice after in, uh, our experience. It's very important to break the controlled knowledge of the former secret police. That's a central point, I think. To prevent legends about the past and all East European countries have that problem. And the practical, pragmatic advice is concerning the legacy of the secret police is uh, that make sure to safeguard, to protect 
the legacy of the secret police against manipulation, against destruction, against theft. And later the parliaments and independent organizations can decide how to manage, how to handle with it. But this first pragmatic advice I can give to all countries transforming their systems is uh, make sure to safeguard and to protect the legacy in an independent way. And last word, you will need a long breath, we say in German. Uh, uh, that means you cannot have the hope to have very quick results uh, coming to terms with the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Foster. Foster. Uh, indeed, you mentioned uh, uh, something very important. Uh, uh, first of all, to eliminate the influence uh, of uh, this uh, representative of the former communist secret police uh, in our political life uh, in, the, in, the, in the present, uh, but also to prevent uh, the mythology of the past, about the past, the mythology or the legends about uh, the past. And this is especially on, on, on our region here in the Balkan very uh, difficult because uh, uh, very often uh, these uh, uh, forces from the past are trying to present uh, their activities as uh, national interest uh, uh, fighting for uh, some uh, good uh, um, yeah, good aims uh, uh, especially in former Yugoslavia I don't know if a representative of, uh, of the diplomatic corps from this part uh, uh, of our neighbors are here but uh, that will be a long discussion not only in uh, North Africa Middle East but also in former Yugoslavia especially Serbia Macedonia where uh, the influence of this secret police uh, to the political life is uh, very, uh, very uh, extensive. Now, another experience uh, from uh, former Czechoslovakia, maybe, but now Czech Republic. Uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Uh, Lenky. Uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I uh, I would like to thank you for the invitation and for the possibility to share to you and with you our experiences, but pr problems and mistakes too, how to come to terms with totalitarian regime, in our case with totalitarian communism. At the beginning, on, on a, of velvet, uh, so-called Velvet Revolution in uh, November 1989, uh, we haven't no experience how to come to terms with totalitarian regime. Our colleagues in Germany, uh, Federal Republic of German, Germany, has uh, had a experience uh, how to come to terms with Nazism from the end uh, of uh, Second World War. Uh, we had uh, many problems in Czechoslovakia and then in uh, Czech Republic, uh, economical transformation and so on. A uh, long way to how to renew the democracy and uh, rule of state. The attitudes uh, of political elites in Czechoslovakia and Czech Republic uh, were different. On the other side, uh, consequent, uh, consequently, uh, to come to the terms with totalitarian regime. On the other side, uh, to leave it to fall into oblivion. But it is almost possible to leave in, it into oblivion. And what would be the consequences? Uh, I would like to say 
uh, that uh, the reconciliation with the past in Czechoslovakia and Czech Republic, uh, there are three ways, three levels, uh, fundamental levels, how to come to terms with a totalitarian regime. Uh, the level uh, administrative uh, political level, then the level uh, of the criminal law and, uh, and very, very uh, significant is to open the archives. Uh, three levels, but uh, these three levels, all three levels are and were helpful and uh, useful. Uh, and uh, each level is complement to another uh, level. Uh, legislative, administrative, uh, uh, level. It was uh, without uh, greater problems uh, in 1990 was adopted uh, uh, the act uh, regarding uh, judicial rehabilitation of victims of totality and their compensation and at least partial remedy of property uh, of uh, property injustice. Then was adopted 1991, so much criticized and discussed, on, and not only the, in Czech Republic, the act on lustration, so-called lustration law, which has been an important instrument of legal and democratic state so as to prevent to return to the time of non-freedom and totality. I must say that this step was useful and good. The act on illustration is uh, till today in force and for instance our institute, or institute for study of totalitarian regime an archive of uh, the former repressive body uh, of communist states. Uh, according to the law, we are the duty to support all documents, all materials uh, regarding persons to uh, National Security Office. I, I would like to say uh, there was there were happen there, there was uh, happened no catastrophic scenario as we discussed this matter at the beginning in uh, uh, 90s. Uh, it was very very significant. For instance. Uh, in 1993 was adopted uh, the act on illegal, illegality, unlawfulness of uh, communist regime and direct chain of events uh, uh, with above mentioned act and with the extent of serious crime of totalitarian regime and the need of the complex investigation of the crimes of communists led in 1995 to establishment of the Office for the, for the Documentation and invest Investigation of the Crimes of Communist Regime uh, in Prague. Uh, this office exists and is still active and has a competence of criminal police of the, of the Czech uh, Republic. Dealing with the past, uh, 
on the level of criminal law, the tools of transitional justice, criminal law play a central role, especially in public perception, but above all in this, in the requirements of the rule of law. All crimes, despite who and when committed, it must be condemned and punished. Punish it. There is the act of the justice, no the act of revenge or hatred. And the victims have the right to know full truth. But uh, what is the result of investigations in, in Czech Republic? Uh, mention and to Office for the Investigation initiate and open a thousand cases regarding, regarding crimes of communism. But the result, 173 accused persons, uh, 74 first persons were charged, lawfully sentences were only eight persons to unsuspended term of imprisonment, and 22 persons got suspended sentence. Uh, we have a uh, 100,000 on victim and the results of prosecution are not sufficient. Why? During many ju judicial processes in 19s, there were time delays and many witnesses and defendants died. Among a lot of judges and prosecutors was not a willingness to prosecute and punish the crimes. The legal qualification of the crimes and its perpetration was investigated as excesses of individuals, for instance, abuse of authority of the officers, and not as organized crimes of communist state and communist party, of communist uh, regime. A majority of those who did, who did the injustice prepared, prepared and directed it were not accused or sentenced. They remain unpunished and their crimes have not been declared clearly. To come to terms with totalitarian regime on this level, uh, to condemn the crimes, it is not only the act of justice, but about all it is important need for the whole society clear declaration of, of concrete crimes and their concrete perpetrators. And it is important for binding and recovery of legal conscience of the society that was systematically in an international devastated by the old regime. And it is very important for strengthening of rule of law and democracy in the future and in the present. The third level is uh, to open, opening uh, the archive of the all repressive uh, bodies uh, that was happening uh, in year 2007. And uh, the Czech, uh, Czech Act uh, for the access to the archive is most liberal in the middle Europe. Each physical person aged 18 has possibility to access these materials. It, it is no difference between Czech and Czech citizens and uh, foreign citizens. Uh, let me say at the end, in, 1990, uh, in 1996 uh, I, I visited well-known so-called hunter of Nazism of uh, uh, criminals of Nazism, Mr. Simon Wiesenthal, in his documentation center in Vienna. As the first subject matter, he said to me, 
please. It is my personally very important experience. If you will discuss on crimes of communists or Nazism, please speak quite concrete to the people on concrete events, destinies, tragedies about concrete victims and quite concrete crimes and perpetrations. Only this is important to prevent to the prevention of these trage tragedies in the present and in the future. Thank you for, for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lecky. Indeed, you uh, touch upon uh, uh, two very important uh, topics. I mean, the illustration, which is a very difficult discussion in many countries and the forces from the past are trying to prevent any kind of uh, debate sometime about the topic uh, and to, to uh, even convince us that this is not a uh, praxis in uh, uh, no one country in Europe, which we know this is the contrary. And uh, as we heard from our German colleagues, uh, uh, Germany is thinking to prolong till 2019 uh, the uh, validity of uh, uh, this uh, measurement for the public uh, officials. Uh, we had currently in Bulgaria the debate uh, very uh, extensive even on the level of constitutional court about uh, uh, the possibility for uh, non uh, taking politically for public, uh, high public of, uh, of officials, uh, offices, uh, positions for people uh, who was a member of uh, the former secret police uh, services or agent of these uh, secret police services. Now we had three cases from uh, Eastern Europe, Bulgaria, Germany, Czech or Czechoslovakia, uh, Czech Republic now. Uh, but uh, uh, let's, uh, uh, I'm very curious to hear what is the opinion of uh, our colleague from Egypt, uh, and I give immediately the floor of Mr. Sadek. Okay. Please, uh, and please about uh, six to ten minutes max. <laughs> okay. Uh, as you all know, Arab regimes uh, were not developmental regimes, but uh, security, intelligence, police uh, states. And uh, it is no wonder that the spark for the revolution in Egypt and Tunisia had to do with uh, the security. Mohammed Bouaziz in Tunisia, uh, clashing with a police woman. In Egypt, Khalid Saeed in the summer of uh, 2010, a man who had been brutally killed. And the government uh, did a lot of whitewash to defend its own uh, detectives. And uh, uh, all those incidents provoked public opinion and uh, led to uh, this revolution. The cases we just heard from our colleagues in communist countries uh, are, are complete cases. Our cases are still in transition. So we are not uh, having the full uh, picture. Uh, revolutions go through stages. The first stage is eruption. The second stage is counter-revolution. The third stage is transition, creating a new political order. The fourth stage is, is consolidating the new political system. Egypt today is going through the first three stages. There is revolution, there is counter-revolution, there is gestation for the new political system. When Mubarak left, we have today four forces in operation in the country. Uh, the first force is the SCAF. This is the military of Mubarak, Mubarak general. The military in any Arab political system is the first line of defense for the regime. So the ideas about transitional justice is different from the transitional justice uh, ideas that would be provided by other forces. The second force that emerged are liberal, uh, secular uh, forces. And those people want uh, Western type democracy, and so they want the rule of the law, and uh, very fast, and they are revolutionary. The third uh, block is a political Islam block, and it consists of several uh, groups, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, the, the Salafi, the Islamic group. Uh, we are not sure what they want to do with transitional justice, but from history we remember uh, when the Supreme Guide in the late 40s was assassinated, Hassan al-Banna, and they entered an alliance with the uh, uh, military, they prosecuted 
uh, uh, after 1952, those who killed uh, uh, the leader. So we don't know if they come to power, are they going to open files and prosecute those who tortured them, those who put them in jail or not? This is again an open question. The fourth group in operation in, uh, in Egypt today are the remnant of the old regime who benefited from the regime. They stole lands, they stole property, they took advantage of a lot of things. And so to them, transitional justice can be dangerous because it would claim back some of those uh, properties. And so they may be uh, working against uh, that. Uh, so what do the people in Egypt, what are the demands that they want uh, uh, during the transitional period? One is you know, criminal accountability. Uh, they want the Mubaraks and the heads of the state security and the Ministry of Interior and the officers who were involved in torture and killing the protesters during the revolution. Look, most of the discussion is about what happened during the revolution. Nobody goes back uh, in the last 30 years because of real politique. Uh, because if you go back, you would have to involve the SCAF because they were also part of the Mubarak regime and the security system, and so they would be put on trial. They would also involve the, the wealth. It, it, it would open a lot of things that uh, nobody can afford now. And, and that's why most of the demands are concentrating on uh, 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 what happened after the revolution. Uh, they want also restructuring of the interior ministry and the state security. This happened, it is now called the homeland security, but not completely. Uh, it is not satisfactory. Still, the, the behavior of the Ministry of Interior is provocative. It continues the, the same old policies. Uh, they refuse a lot of international assistance to restructure uh, the Ministry of Interior. I think the government of Georgia, other governments had offered uh, 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 proposals to restructure the, the Ministry of Interior. And uh, I think the Egyptian uh, Police Academy has many studies about what happened in East Europe but nobody has the political will to do it. And I think this has to do with the fact that SCAF might use the police in the future to clash with the demonstrators. And so condemning any police officer uh, today can be uh, dangerous uh, for the future uh, transition in Egypt. Also, uh, state-run media um, are also considered enemy to the people. That's why you'll find demonstrations against the TV building, uh, because it takes the side of the government against the people. Um, <clears throat> Uh, there are laws now that have been issued to ban uh, former, uh, former uh, top uh, leaders of the NDP and the government from running into politics for five years. But this needs a, 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 a legal uh, uh, motion uh, that uh, takes place. Mubarak went to trial and some of his top leaders uh, and family, but uh, some people uh, you know, uh, look uh, at such trials as uh, uh, a farce or a cover-up, you will find media reports that uh, the trials are not really uh, serious and uh, uh, over a year had passed and we don't see any uh, uh, serious uh, 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 condemnation. If you remember, um, since 1980, 69 uh, rulers or heads of state went to trial all over the world. Uh, some trial uh, continued until the the head of state died, like in Argentina, the, like Chile, um, uh, Pinochet. Uh, he, he faced 250 charges and died uh, uh, without any conviction. Uh, the charges are not going deeper because I think if it goes deeper, it can undermine the security system, it can undermine a lot of uh, networks, and so they are not really uh, pushing uh, uh, for what is happening. Uh, uh, we had a law uh, that uh, was issued in 1952 uh, uh, or 53 to get rid of the old politicians when the military coup took, took place. It was amended and they added something again, but, uh, but uh, they, they took into consideration that many who are in power today can be affected and so it was not sweeping or strong enough to do it. There were attempts to call for uh, taking the matter in their hands. Uh, there was a Facebook uh, site asking uh, for the families of the martyrs to take revenge uh, and, and, and do it, but that uh, site was deleted. 
uh, people are pushing for the rule of law, they are pushing the judges to, do, to take an action, they are pushing uh, for the reforms in the judicial system to take the side of the people and though it has always been taking many sides but uh, when, when, when it involves top leaders uh, there is always this suspicion that they will not uh, be uh, uh, on that uh, side. Uh, um, as I mentioned, uh, the main focus is on the last year. All the violations is on the last year. Nobody is going beyond that. And uh, um, uh, they went in one of the cases that uh, uh, the, one of the cases that uh, sparked the Egyptian revolution was uh, Khalid Saeed that had uh, received many uh, attention. It was brought again to the court, and uh, they got uh, a condemnation this time, and the detectives who killed him got seven years in jail. Uh, and it was the same page, we are all Khalid Saeed, that called for the Egyptian revolution. So the issue about human rights in Egypt is very important. Um, this is Khalid Saeed and the revolution. Uh, and they were not happy with all the court rulings and uh, reports that were issued by the government, you know, trying to say that the man committed suicide. This was the official uh, uh, version, but anyway, it was brought. Uh, another tactic that is being used uh, up till today by the Egyptian uh, revolutionaries in, is naming and shaming. Uh, there is encyclopedia for those who were involved in, in torture, put on Flickr, you can find it. Uh, there are uh, um, popular attempts to uh, commemorate the memory of the martyrs. Every Friday, they would say we have a, uh, this uh, Friday is to uh, honor the, the memory of the, the martyrs, but we don't have a museum for the martyrs. We have not turned the state security headquarters, uh, for example, into a museum to be visited. Uh, but uh, we have some Facebook sites with the documents uh, taken from the state security, uh, allegedly, these are the official documents documents uh, showing how the, the system was functioning. They had the user, uh, user names, uh, passwords uh, for Facebook, emails, and stuff like that. Um, uh, they also, oh, just recently, the government tried to do uh, what the Tunisians did. They have a ministry to help uh, the, the wounded and the martyrs of the revolution. Uh, so we have a very small number, but uh, this is uh, the, uh, what is being done. We have sites that are helping uh, also uh, regarding uh, uh, human rights uh, and the violation of human rights. Uh, we are still in a transition, and I cannot say that uh, uh, we, will ha we are having um, uh, a happy ending yet, uh, but uh, we are struggling. Uh, this is one of the... Um, Facebook site that is talking about uh, a sniper who was targeting through rubber bullets uh, Egyptian protesters. The government arrested him, but then they, they said that he escaped. Uh, and uh, of course, <coughs> it raises again the issue about the political implication. If they convict such people, it can affect the performance of the police in general and also the, uh, how it will be used in the future. Uh, these are also some of the sites for the martyrs of the Egyptian revolution, uh, and they put them here and there. Uh, and, uh, you know, all the time claiming we want justice, we want uh, uh, justice to be done, and the martyrs' blood cannot uh, be left. Uh, we don't have uh, truth commission. Uh, we had uh, uh, some investigative uh, uh, committees on some incidents that happened after the revolution, nothing before the revolution. Uh, and uh, not many people were happy with the outcome of those uh, reports. Uh, 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 there is some reparations, the government promised reparations for the martyrs and those who were, were wounded, but they are very slow in delivering, and that's why every now and then you will find demonstrations by the families of the martyrs. Uh, we don't have gender justice yet uh, when it comes to the issue 
of women, uh, especially, though, again, nobody talks about before the revolution. During the revolution, there were many systematic sexual attacks on women and reporters, and this did not uh, get addressed up till today. For example, the attack on Egyptian women uh, during the International Women's Day, the video clips are there online, and we have not seen Egyptian authorities taking any action to arrest those who were involved. Um, uh, the security system, the reform has not, uh, uh, I mean, they made some changes with some of the state security officials, they, they, they made some people retire, um, uh, but uh, recently we have seen the same acts by the riot police uh, uh, violently against demonstrators. Uh, the intelligence service is out of the picture when it comes to reform. Only, we are only talking about the Ministry of Interior, nobody talks about the intelligence service that was also part of the system. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Said, for this very important uh, information, what you provided uh, to us, and uh, uh, especially what you said. If uh, there is no political will, will for, ch for changes in, in the uh, forces, in the Ministry of Interior, uh, we can share, or they can know many things about other cases in transitional uh, period, uh, but if they don't have the political will to do this, if they are the same people, and I can tell you, you cannot expect from the uh, same people to make uh, a revolutionary change also inside of uh, ministries, uh, which are expected, especially ministries of interior or in the military. Uh, what you said about the uh, Murbarak uh, trial, that uh, will be in, uh, not serious, I can tell you we had the same with Zhivkov's trial. He, this trial was also not uh, serious. He was, uh, go, uh, he was uh, accused by, for selective distribution of uh, flats to some people and uh, uh, was uh, actually a farce. Um, I would like now to use the remaining minutes uh, for a uh, questioning session, and I, was, uh, I know there is a lot of interest, but uh, I would like to uh, take three uh, questions and then to give uh, the possibility for the panelists to answer these three questions. So who, maybe ladies first, sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, oh, who? Thank you, Chairperson. Um, uh, both the former President Zhelev and Mr. Kostadinov uh, expressed regret about Bulgaria not dealing with their past for the first 10 years after the fall of communism. And um, I found that a, a, an a important and interesting point, but I haven't, from what they said, quite got to grips with why, why this happened. Thank you. Maybe you was first, yes, please. My name is uh, uh, Sorry, m micro, micro, okay. here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mohammed Salim Dra. I'm a lawyer and a human rights activist from Libya. Uh, first of all, and in a very uh, quick way, I would like to thank uh, those who are responsible for organizing this uh, platform. Uh, we are very impressed of the hosp hospitality. Uh, my first remark really regarding uh, maybe the anthem which is facing the past. And then you used uh, North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, let me say that uh, the opinion in the area maybe they are differ a little bit. We look to the area as a one part, not really two parts. Maybe the Arab Spring is another sign or another proof that we live in the same area and there is no separation between those two areas. This is the first point. Uh, the second point, I really enjoyed uh, this panel uh, and I heard the experience of Bulgaria regarding the forming of a committee regarding those, the, the documents. We have small experience in Libya. Unfortunately, after the Libyan revolution, there is no uh, uh, an organization to take care of the documents, at least as far as I know. So, especially after the liberation of Tripoli, Libya, we face 
a very difficult times regarding the document protection. Buslim, a very uh, well-known place, is full of documents, and we had to move. Of course, I was cooperating with the, with the, with the civil society committee, which took the responsibility to protect the documents in Abu Slim. They went there, okay, and the documents were open. Everybody uh, can have an access to those documents. They are very, very dangerous documents, but we didn't find a safer place to put it. Finally, we had uh, an institute uh, uh, taking care of the Libyan history, and we succeeded to protect those documents. There are thousands and thousands of documents in Libya where uh, 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 journalists and maybe uh, a lot of people who are interested in those documents, and I believe that we lost uh, a great number of those important documents. Some of them, they were leaked, and uh, they took abroad outside of Libya. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, because we I still, a little if, bit. If, if, if I try one, to summarize, I have, another, I have another remark regarding Mr. Hussein. Yeah. Please, please. Is my time out? Please, one, one okay. sentence more. Okay, one more uh, remark regarding uh, uh, what Mr. Hester said, which is do we have to cut with the past or we have to reconciliate with the past? This is a, a very important issue as far as I know. I, do we have to face the past or postpone the main problems? What I've heard that uh, 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 a lot of advice is that as soon as possible we have to face the past. In Libya, and this is the most important thing according to my own view, in Libya I feel uh, the, the matters are completely different. In Libya we are uh, well can connected people. I mean it's too big, a very big country, but still you cannot find the family in the East doesn't have a very uh, important connections with the West. And Thank you. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. To, have, to, to give the opportunity well, from this side, please. Uh, microphone. microphone. And then we will try to answer your questions or your remarks. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, very short. Yeah, 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 just straight to the questions. Uh, very fascinating presentations, we really want to thank you. Uh, the questions, uh, I have uh, three questions for the uh, three cases uh, that they have, uh, that they're done with the, ex with the transition. Uh, one, you addressed the, uh, <coughs> the perpetrators and uh, the, rel the relieving of the names of the uh, Stasi and other security uh, uh, things. Did you uh, experience act of revenge and retaliation? Uh, and if not, why not? Uh, the second question is about, the question is about really the, the victims, uh, because you dealt with or your presentation focused on the perpetrator. But what about the victims? Did you? Uh, uh, document uh, their experiences and their stories about what happened in the past, because what happened in the past, the way I heard it, focused mainly about uh, from the intelligence and from the regime side. But as part of the national healing process for the country, did you document these stories and these uh, experiences? And the third question, uh, what did you do with the, uh, with the regime friends uh, outside the country, whether be it uh, countries other countries or individuals or communities, uh, how did you deal with that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now the three questions we will try to answer and I will ask also my uh, colleagues here to be very, very, very uh, straightforward and maybe uh, even with uh, one or two sentences to answer the questions because we have a lot of interest and I will give an example. I will answer the question of Madam Ambassador. Uh, it's a very uh, simple and also very difficult one and uh, what Mr. Sadek said, political will. We lost 10 years because of uh, lack of political will in Bulgaria to deal with the past and because of the methodology created amongst these uh, uh, services and uh, uh, didn't find a political consensus and unfortunately we lost this uh, more than 10 years time uh, until we had the started with the first uh, committee for uh, opening the archives. 
but the uh, uh, questions was now uh, to, I think, Mr. Förster, uh, and uh, maybe one, one remark from my, my side, because we are also, as Bulgarians, very interested in your archive as well. You know our uh, famous uh, uh, case, uh, and we expect as well uh, that uh, some uh, evidence and true will come to the public, uh, and uh, we will know what exactly happened and why our, why our nurses was... Uh, uh, in this situation and uh, panel to that uh, and why we had this uh, uh, exactly if, if you say that you have now one institute of uh, sure sure and uh, we are looking forward very very uh, concerned from one side but also interested uh, what will happen in Libya and we wish you a lot of uh, success on the way to democratization Mr. Foster, maybe uh, to, uh, to yes, I can, this I can get the last three yes, questions to me. Yes, yes, yes. The last um, one. The, uh, as far as I uh, understood it correctly, you asked firstly uh, again um, for the revenges. So we didn't have any case of revenge as far as I know, but that uh, may be the consequence of the special situation in Germany. We didn't have a comparable situation with, uh, for example, Arabia, because the Stasi, during the last decades of the existence of the GDR, uh, didn't uh, practice uh, violence, direct violence like torture or murder. That was more um, psychological um, demoralization of the opposition and uh, that was uh, um, crazy <laughs> collecting of information <coughs> about 158 kilometers of papers, but it wasn't, uh, it hasn't been uh, uh, direct violence, and so uh, we didn't have uh, such uh, cases of direct revenges, and of course, we have a rather stable system of um, <coughs> security and um, <coughs> courts in the unified Germany, so it's more difficult. That's a special privileged situation in Germany, I must emphasize. The second question was, uh, if I understand it correctly, how do we uh, make document, uh, documentaries, documents, of the cases for the public. Um, that is a very important point. As I mentioned uh, in my first statement, uh, the media, the press, and the science have access to the files. They can publish books. They can make documentary films. And a second and a third point I have to mention, that is uh, political education. And that will become more and more important to prevent those legends I mentioned before. And those documentaries and those material for political education in the schools we are making. And it's very important, Mr. Gauck, the first federal commissioner, said the records of the secret police of the Stasi is like a medicine against nostalgia. And that is a good word. But I have to emphasize that the personal data of victims of data subjects only can be used in the documentaries with their agreement, with their consent. But the personal data of employees and supporters of the Stasi can be used. The th uh, last question was um, the um, relation to the supporters of the re regime outside of the former GDR. Uh, that is more, uh, I think that is more a political uh, uh, question. That is not a question of our authority. Of course, uh, we uh, um, provide uh, documents about everybody who uh, supported um, and uh, worked for the Stasi and uh, the um, work and of course the relation to foreign countries is also 
an important topic for researchers and journalists and every uh, journalist and scientist from another country can make a request with us. But we can give out, uh, we can provide the names uh, of uh, persons only uh, uh, without their consent, only if they were supporters or um, uh, employees of the Stasi. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe uh, we can also recommend a very famous movie, uh, The Life of the Others, uh, which is co-funded by the uh, European Union as well, and uh, show exactly the instruments, of, especially of uh, Stasi. Uh, I have a problem. I have, we have six more minutes, but uh, we have many questions. So please be on the top, on the, on the point. Uh, you was first, I think, uh, uh, and, and then I, uh, one, one lady, and then here. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a question to Mr. Förster. You hear me? Yes. Okay. There is a book outside, a very big book, Das Amt und die Vergangenheit. Okay, it's a book about the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the former Federal Republic of Germany. It was published only last year. So the, the past of the Germany is not only the past of the of Stasi, but of, of the past of a national socialism, which was maybe not so... Uh, in the presence, but what do we say about this uh, this topic? What have you learned? Maybe it's a question beyond uh, beyond your competence uh, in your office. But uh, what can we learn from this book? Was it too late to publish it, or was it in time to read about the uh, policy in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Thank you. Yeah, the first. Uh Floor, you you ask for the question and then to, uh, and then you I would like also to give more the, the to, to our friends from uh, uh, from there are three things I want to address. They're very important for us. I mean documents. Uh, democracy takes uh, a long uh, time. And when uh, we go uh, or face uh, the past, doesn't this uh, affect our thinking about the present? I think that going too deep in the past uh, affects uh, the past, uh, the present, and also the future. So, doesn't, didn't this affect the democratic transition and the democratic change? Revolution in Tunisia was caused mainly by uh, uh, economic and social injustice, lack of equity. Uh, it was a cry for dignity. It was also a cry for social justice. In the aftermath of the revolution, um, most of the, um, well, which fortunately did not uh, take a lot of human lives, so although every human life is very precious, but uh, most of our uh, dictators in the regions were re ready to sacrifice uh, even the whole population to stay in, uh, in power. Well, I wanted to say that um, although the, the, the revolution was caused by social injustice, etc., the message of the uh, politician uh, was very uh, was an elitist message, uh, and the results of the elections, the latest in elections in Tunisia, showed it. The first winner was the party that appealed to the uh, faith. The second winner uh, relied on a, an emotional message. Uh, he made people dream, and the third one uh, promised transitional justice. Uh, the problem is that, um, in the absence of the dictator and his wife who were responsible for most of the crimes in Tunisia, be it uh, corruption or... Uh, the responsibility 
of the senior officials and their subordinates uh, is very hard to pinpoint right now. Th there are no clear, there are clear signs that some of the cases and files uh, are uh, lost or even destroyed. There was the destruction, destruction of some of the archives in Tunisia just after the revolution. I know my, my question is, should we start and uh, um, on the transi tra transitional justice right away with the risk of uh, being unjust? or wait a little bit until feelings uh, um, uh, water down or feelings of revenge uh, are not as strong as before to see more clearly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, no more time for more questions. I'm very sorry. Uh, we need to, uh, to finish and uh, we are here uh, later on during the lunch and uh, later for a, a discussion one to one. I would like to give the, the floor to my uh, colleagues to answer the last three questions. Uh, uh, and please, uh, so quite sure, who would like to, to start? Maybe, maybe you can. Maybe answer, uh, the first question is here. Is an um, important one. Transitions, uh, transitions can take a long time because it, it depends on it's case by case. And the circumstances in every country are different. Uh, so you cannot say, because you stayed five years, others uh, stayed ten years, it should be that case in your uh, situation. It all depends on your situation, your, the, the, the level of, uh, uh, of uh, political and democratic awareness, uh, how many political parties are they ready or not, uh, what are the tasks in front of them. Uh, for example, let me give you a very sensitive issue regarding the Ministry of Interior. One of the most sensitive uh, uh, places to reform are the interior ministry, like, the, like also the, the judicial system. Uh, there are a lot of sensitivity. And if you make the wrong move, you can have a civil war. Like in, in Iraq, for example, they deleted the Ministry of Defense and, and they fired. Then well, what happens? Those people went to the street with the guns and they know everything and you have a disaster. So such uh, 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 departments need to be approached slowly, uh, firmly, and take your time. I mean, you cannot uh, all of a sudden fire them, they will all be against you, and you don't have enough weapons and techniques to fight such people. I mean, they are well trained, and so you, ha you have to take that into consideration. It has to be very slow, progressive, and uh, to on the track. I would like to give uh, the floor also to President uh, Jelef because uh, his experience is also very uh, enormous, I will say, in the transition. Um, as far as I understood, the question was why Bulgaria did not address uh, uh, the issue of uh, collaborators and agents uh, earlier, why this issue stayed for, uh, around for so long. Well, I was the first person who uh, made redundant uh, uh, diplomats uh, who worked as a collaborators of the uh, secret uh, service. This happened two or three months after I was elected uh, president. Then I uh, dismissed the uh, diplomats uh, uh, who worked in the capital cities of uh, the Western uh, uh, Europe and North America. I remember a conversation with Mrs. Thatcher, and she told me, well, Mr. President, why uh, don't you recall these collaborators of the state security? Don't you know them? Well, they have worked against us for so long. We know them. Uh, we have information about them in our computers. We don't trust them. So I agreed with Mrs. Thatcher that they uh, need to be recalled, they need to be dismissed because they were demoralized, uh, it was clear who they were, they were demotivated. Uh, 
because uh, if you have worked until, so to say, yesterday for the communist regime, suddenly to turn into an anti-communist. So I recall the ambassadors from the U.S., Canada, the U.K., in France, uh, other people were appointed, the representatives of the in intelligence, intelligence uh, people who did not have such burden from the past. And I was the first the first person who opened a file, a specific file, uh, the record of Mr. Peter Beron. He was my deputy. I was the head of the opposition prior to the uh, parliamentary elections for Great uh, National Assembly. And when I was elected president, <coughs> uh, Mr. Peter Beron uh, took the position of leader of the opposition, but uh, 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 suddenly information leaked uh, on the walls, uh, anonymous information appeared, so then I called the Minister of Interior uh, of, the se of the government of Andrei Lukanov and asked, Minister, Please bring around the record, the file of uh, Mr. Peter Baron. And one day he brought over a big suitcase, uh, five kilos probably, and I went through the file. Once I finished with uh, this, I called Mr. Peter Baron and I said, you were a collaborator of the 6th Department of the State Security Service. I uh, quoted to him uh, whole um, paragraphs of his file and he understood that this will become uh, public knowledge. And he said, okay, what are we going to do? And I said, well, the, the best thing for you and for, you, for the Union of Democratic Forces is to resign from both positions, uh, head of the Coordinating Council of the Union of Democratic Forces and head of the parliamentary group of the UDF. And that's what Mr. Baron did. After that, uh, uh, there so much material was published uh, and it became clear that he was a collaborator. But the question was why these issues were not uh, addressed radically. Well, because we lost the first elections. Our opposition was not strong enough to win the first e democratic elections and also we made some serious mistakes. That is, we did not carry out the elections in the end of the year. We uh, agreed to have elections in uh, June of 1990. If that happened in the end of 1989, the Communist Party and the regime would have uh, completely collapsed because uh, uh, the lack of uh, goods, commodities, uh, the deficiency, everything was uh, um, in, uh, there was shortage of everything on the market, and we would have uh, saved the society from this. But what we did, in fact, was we saved the former communists instead of saving the people from the crisis. That's how it, it worked, and that's why they had such a great majority and in the parliament we could not raise the issue for a radical uh, um, change, although I had raised the issue in front of the Council of Europe. But they said, oh, no, no, you will exclude people from the political life. This is what fascists uh, did. And it was impossible to do anything. We could not uh, act against the Council of Europe. And that's why we had this uh, partial uh, um, solution to the problems. And there was another mistake uh, that our uh, opposition committed. We did not uh, uh, sue uh, Todor Zhivkov and the regime <coughs> on the basis of the documents uh, uh, from the 1963 when Khrushchev was in power when they voted at a secret uh, 
session of the Bulgarian Communist Party for Bulgaria to become the 16th uh, uh, Republic of uh, uh, USSR. Now these documents have been disclosed and published. And the other thing what happened 10 years later under Leonid Brezhnev in 1973, Brezhnev was in a very bad uh, health, and he did nothing, and thank God he did nothing. Then there was a trial against Todoshivko, but this was a, a farce, a, a ridiculous uh, trial. Why he uh, gave uh, some... Uh, support to some uh, actress to buy uh, an apartment or to some uh, writer to buy a car. It was uh, really ridiculous. Uh, this That's why he was uh, sued and uh, the people laughed uh, at us. And this coincided with uh, setting free, with release, Releasing from position, I'm sorry, Mr. Vasil Mrychkov, uh, the prosecutor of the time, and the great uh, uh, National Assembly elected a new uh, prosecutor. Mr. President, we cannot address the whole uh, history of the transition. Well, it won't be the whole history, only two or three more sentences. This person was elected uh, by the great uh, National Assembly, Mr. Martin Gunev, a very uh, honest person. But, and I was the one who appointed him because he was uh, elected by the parliament. However, some time later, I invited him to uh, have a discussion because I cannot order him and I asked him how is it possible that the prosecution did not uh, uh, self uh, sanction itself and start such a political uh, trial why don't you sue Toto Zhivko for uh, um, treason. treason and if that happened then we would have been in a position to ban the Communist Party. This would have been a perfect reason. However, Mr. Gunev resigned. Mr. Ivan Tatarchev uh, became the next uh, prosecutor, and he, instead of persecuting uh, Politburo, he arrested those uh, who ousted uh, Mr. Zhivko from power. Thank you, Mr. President, for everything you shared with us. Uh, you are right. This was, these were the facts. We have uh, many things to tell to our friends from the Arab countries about uh, best practice and also the not so best practice, and we hope they would not repeat our mistakes. I'm sure during the continuation of our SOFIA platform, you will have the opportunity to discuss it, uh, your topics again. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the meal now. Thank you.